Hello and welcome to So What You're Saying Is, I'm Peter Whittle. Now I'm delighted that my guest today is Matt Ridley, Viscount Ridley. He is best known perhaps to you as a columnist for The Times. He's also written numerous books, best-selling books, on science, economics and indeed political philosophy. His latest book, extremely timely, is Viral, The Search for the Origin of COVID-19. It's out this week, and he's co-authored it with Alina Chen. Um, thank you very much for coming, Matt. Thank you for having me. It's, it's a pleasure. Um, I, I wanted to start, really, before we look at the book, by asking you, to me, this is one of the biggest questions of all. How did this thing come about? And yet what I think it was, was characterised at the time was the sheer reluctance, it seemed, on the part of the media to even ask the question. Would you agree with that? Yes, I would. Uh, I've been shocked by the lack of curiosity that uh, politicians, the media, uh, the scientific establishment themselves have on the whole, with some very honourable exceptions, shown into this question. Two years in, today is almost exactly two years since the uh, first case that we know of, which was retrospectively diagnosed on the 17th of November uh, 2019. Two years in, we don't know how this pandemic started. It's the most devastating thing uh, to hit mankind for a very long time. It's killed millions of people. It's disrupted the lives of hundreds of millions. Um, it's vitally important that we find out where this come from, uh, came from so that we know how to prevent the next one and also to deter people who are watching this episode and thinking, ooh, I could wreak havoc if I deliberately mm. caused one of these. Mm. So to, to, for, for most of the media to say, well, it, it, it probably came out of this wet market, but we don't have any evidence of that. But, you know, nonetheless, let's assume that. Um, uh, and, and there is still no evidence for that. It's still possible, but there's still no evidence for it. And yes, we know the Chinese aren't really being very helpful in telling us what happened, and there's a lot of obfuscation, but we shouldn't be too worried about that. They're a communist regime, after all, they do that kind of thing. Mm. That shocked me. Um, I really didn't think that was good enough. Uh, I think it's the most important mystery of our lifetime. I think we deserve to find out the answer, uh, and we should turn over every stone until we find out how this happened. But why do you think there was that reticence? Well, early on, um, the science most close to virology, the virologists community, um, got two articles out there, one in The Lancet and one in Nature Medicine, saying we can rule out any laboratory-based origin. Uh, we know enough already. And this was in February, March 2020. Um, uh, they didn't know enough already to rule out that. Um, it was ridiculous uh, to come to that conclusion based on the extremely limited information at the time. What they were worried about was partly some very weird conspiracy theories that were starting about it being a bioweapon or a failed vaccine project or something, which on the whole were crackpot and did need to be ruled out. But that's not the same as saying that a laboratory accident could be ruled out, and they should never have, have done that. The media took their cue from that and said, oh, by the way, it's been ruled out. I did too. Mm -hmm. I mean, in March and April, I was saying to friends, no, no, it, it, it's, it's been ruled out. I haven't read the paper properly, but it says they can rule it out. And then I did read the paper properly, and I thought, well, hang on, these arguments don't fully stack up. Um, I don't quite understand how they're coming to that conclusion. And by the way, where is the infected animal in the market? Where is the record of the early cases of this disease being mm. food handlers, as it was in the case of SARS? There was no such evidence. And so I began to dig further and got more and more intrigued. And um, here we are. Well, yes, I mean, I, I should uh, explain. I mean, the, the overall argument that you make in the book is that we should look at the idea of it coming from a laboratory, isn't it? That, that, that's the thing. You're not, you're not saying it was deliberate, are you? You're saying that it's a possibility that it came from a laboratory by accident. Very much so. And, uh, and, and this, eventually the scientific journalist establishment came around to that point of view. In, in May 2021, they said, uh, you know, there was a big statement in science and then a lot of the media sort of fell in behind that and said, OK, yes, fair point, we can't rule it out and we need mm. to, to take it seriously. Um, uh, so it's, it's not a case of 
saying we know how it happened. We're not saying that. We, we've looked into all the evidence. We lean towards a laboratory leak as the most likely explanation when we've looked at absolutely everything we can think of. And we give the evidence for the market as good a run as we can in our book. You know, we really do try and explore what happened with the pangolin stuff, what happened with the wet market in, uh, in Wuhan, etc. You know, and we have a whole chapter saying, look, here's the best case we can make for it being a natural event. <coughs> and then we have another chapter saying, here's the best case we can make for it being a laboratory accident. Uh, accident is the key word here. We are not alleging that someone deliberately leaked a virus in order to cause harm. Uh, as part of a bioweapon experiment or something like that. Um, uh, it seems to us extremely implausible that that would be the case. Mm. Uh, and it's, you know, it, none of the facts that we've seen support that idea. But the question is, given how many experiments were going on, on bat-borne SARS-like coronaviruses in Wuhan, above all other cities in the mm. world, mm that the top research on this subject was there. More papers coming out of this lab than anyone else in the world on this subject. More uh, samples in the database than anywhere else in the world. Given all that, is it possible that an accident happened in a laboratory? And the answer to that is yes, of course it is, mm -hmm. because accidents happen all the time mm -hmm. in laboratories. SARS, the first SARS virus, leaked four times, actually possibly six times, mm -hmm from laboratories in Beijing, in Taiwan, in Singapore. Um, and in most of those cases, they didn't know it had happened till afterwards, till someone got infected and then they retrospectively said, hang on, this person's got SARS. They were working on SARS in a lab two weeks yeah. ago. Oh my God, they must have picked it up. One of these cases was in the highest possible security laboratories, you know, the, the ones where you know, you're wearing a pressurized suit yes. and that kind of thing. Um, uh, so <clears throat> it's very possible that if this virus was in a laboratory, workers would have picked it up. Of course, uh, the Chinese rather liked, did they not, the wet market idea? I mean, in the sense that it got them off well, the hook. Yes and no. Um, I think that the, the Chinese authorities were torn. They didn't particularly want to point the finger at the uh, wildlife markets mm -hmm. because, ironically, Xi Jinping had just in 2019 persuaded the World Health Organization to recognize traditional Chinese medicine as a valid form of medicine. Right. Now, some parts of Chinese, uh, traditional Chinese medicine are OK, but most of it is quack pseudoscience of the worst kind. It's, you know, if you eat pangolin scales, you will live forever or be more fertile or something like mm. that. Well, pangolin scales are exactly the same material as fingernails. So right. you know, why not eat your fingernails if that's what you, you want, want oh, to well. do? I'll live forever then. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so, so there was, I think, a re uh, an equal reluctance to point the finger at, at the wildlife markets. Mm, mm. And they were quite quick in May 2020 to say, well, not quick, very, but they did eventually say, by the way, none of the animals we tested in the market have tested positive. That wasn't the case with SARS. We, meet, we very quickly yes. found mm. infected animals in the market. Um, uh, so instead of the wet market theory or the lab leak theory, they did a whole bunch of research, which they presented to the World Health Organization, which pathetically signed off on it, saying, here's what we think happened. We think it came into China on frozen food from abroad. Which is, right. uh, sounds ridiculous to a layman like me. But. Well, if that, you just, you know, think that through. Someone somewhere in Southeast Asia is farming some animals that come into contact with a bat. The animals get infected. They're slaughtered. They're frozen. They're packed. They're sent to Wuhan. Right. Why does no one on the farm get infected? Yeah. Why does no one in the packing plant get infected? Why does no one along the chain get infected? Why does no one in any other city get infected to where this pro produce is being sent? Why does it happen in Wuhan, a city which doesn't have a particularly thriving wildlife trade? Guangdong, the southern province, is where most of the wildlife trade happens, mm -hmm. um, etc. So it, and, and oh, and by the way, when you erect a theory, don't you do it because you have some evidence? Yes. Where is your yeah, evidence yeah. of a piece of frozen food that was infected? Oh, and then once it happened once in Wuhan, how does it disappear? How does it never happen again? How, can't, how come we can't find mm. it on any frozen food after the event? 
So it, it, it was the most ridiculous theory you could think of. And yet the World Health Organization, the, their experts who went to, to Wuhan in early 2021, signed off on a document mm. that said that is a more plausible explanation than that there was a laboratory leak in the Wuhan Institute of Virology, which was doing work on bat SARS-related coronaviruses that it had collected from elsewhere in China. Why would they do that? The World Health Organization mm. um, uh, became very beholden to China over the last few years. Um, Dr. Tedros, the director general, was elected with Chinese support. And China basically went around Africa saying, if you support this guy, we'll uh, give you more subsidies. Um, uh, and uh, they, when the outbreak happened, they uh, believed the Chinese statements and repeated them that this was not transmitting human to human. Mm. For several weeks in January, after the Taiwanese were picking up the phone and saying, there is evidence that people are catching it from people mm. in hospitals and in homes. In Wuhan, what are you going to do about it? The, Wu the World Health Organization put out public statements saying there is no evidence of human to human transmission. In other words, every case so far, we're talking middle of January here, every case so far will have been caught from an animal. Mm. Well, that was, they, they'd known for a month that that was not the case, but the Chinese were, were, authorities were reluctant to admit it, and the World Health Organization went along with it. And Dr. Tedros went to Beijing and he met Xi Jinping and he said, uh, words cannot express my admiration for the transparency that you've shown. This was, a, this was at a time when the two whistleblowers in the hospital where these cases had first started cropping up, who'd gone on social media and said, hang on, we've got a nasty new infectious pneumonia here. It could be a SARS-like thing. When they had been reprimanded in the most vicious way and lots of other people had been censored for saying anything about this mm -hmm. and yet the transparency of the Chinese regime was, was being praised. So I simply don't understand how the World Health Organization got itself into this position. Its excuse is that it doesn't have any power to force a member country to let it in and its only way to get in was to uh, dance to their tune. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't think that's good enough, frankly. And I, I think if the World Health Organization did not exist, then we would have started an international investigation into this much sooner and much more yep. effectively. Yes. Before we actually look at how the book pans, pans out, I, I just want to, because I'm sure that most people, including myself, don't really know, what kind of a place is Wuhan, actually? I mean, what, what is this place? I mean, yeah. is it a fishing village? It's not, is it? I mean, what, what is... Yeah, Wuhan is a, is a huge city. It's a city of 11 million people on the Yangtze River in central China. Um, uh, it's about as sort of central in China as you can get. Um, it's, a, it's a national city. It's got particularly strong links with France, historically, funnily enough. And, and actually, the Wuhan Institute of Virology Laboratory was partly built by the French. Um, uh, and uh, it's a big, modern, um, industrial city. Mm. There's, it, it, it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's not a... Uh, the area around Wuhan has been heavily sampled mm. for bat viruses, mm. interestingly because there's a lot of virology research in, based in Wuhan. And uh, they found that they, there are no SARS-like coronaviruses in the bats around there, at least very, very few. They've never found them. And curiously, when they did a study before the pandemic in the area where they could find SARS-like viruses, because there's a lot of interest in where SARS came from in mm. China, uh, in southern Yunnan, and they found that very occasionally, ordinary people do have antibodies <clears throat> to SARS in these areas, yes. you know, which implies that maybe people do sometimes come into contact with bats and pick it up. As a control, as a, as a comparison, they chose the city of Wuhan because this lab is here, not because they thought that the viruses were there. And they showed that, that there's nobody in Wuhan that has antibodies to these kinds of viruses. So this is not a place where these outbreaks happen, naturally. Yes. Yeah. That's the key point, which a lot of people miss. A lot of people think that, oh, they built the Wuhan Institute of Virology in Wuhan because that's where bat viruses are found. It's not true. These viruses are found much further south. I mean, the closest relative of SARS-CoV-2 came from a mine shaft in southern Yunnan, near the Laos border. 
and was collected by the Wuhan Institute of Virology. That is 1,885 kilometers from Wuhan by road, okay, on Google Maps. So, yep. you know, worked it out. Yep. And um, that is uh, the distance from London to Rome. Right. So it wasn't like the Wuhan scientists were just popping out next door and picking up viruses. Yes. They, were going, they were going on very long journeys to get these viruses, bringing them back a very long way to Wuhan and not to anywhere else. That's the point. You know, so that's what makes the city stand out. It is the center of research on these kinds of viruses. Otherwise, it's just a normal Chinese city. Um, the, what struck me about, about the book uh, is uh, it is almost sort of like a thriller in a way. I mean, it, it, it is very much, there's a lot of sleuthing in it. But I think it's the central part of it. Um, I wonder if you could just tell us how that came about, actually. In particular, there is this character called the Seeker. Um, who is, who and what is the Seeker? Yeah. And what part does he yeah. play in your story? Well, you say it's like a, a, a thriller, and we were very careful not to lurch into breathless prose. You no, know, no, he was no. panting as he walked up the hill. You know, that kind of stuff. But what we just wanted to tell we want to stick to the facts wherever mm. we could mm. um, but it turned out as we were writing it that it became more and more like a uh, a detective story in the sense that we had to explain how somebody had found out this piece of information and how that fitted in and how it led to somebody else finding something else out and so on the seeker is a brilliant young indian man uh, living in the city of bubaneshwar um, we do reveal his name in the book. He, he agreed to that, um, but uh, he hadn't done that before, but although he has appeared on, on films before. Um, he's just a highly intelligent young man who, as he put it to us, I just know how to make search engines work for me. Okay, so what he did was he, uh, when he read my co-author's uh, original paper on this that sort of started to get people intrigued about why this virus was so well adapted to infecting human beings from the start, which is an unusual feature. It shouldn't have been like that. He got intrigued by this and he started digging and he managed to get a login details for some Chinese websites, not illegally. He just managed to get someone to share something. Um, and he started uh, researching obscure Chinese websites. And before long, he'd found a bunch of theses, a bunch, a bunch of scientific documents put together um, by scientists, uh, giving huge details about cases they were working on. The first of these turned out to be very important because it was a medical thesis in Kunming, the capital of uh, Yunnan, talking about the treatment of six people for viral pneumonia in 2012, three of whom died. And this was a really serious case of a really scary outbreak mm. uh, that alarmed people all over China, but had never really been, there'd been one brief mention of it before in the literature, but the details were not there till the seeker found this thesis. And what was clear from the thesis is that they thought this was a SARS-like virus, mm. because the men had been working in an abandoned mine shaft, shoveling bat guano, that's what they'd been doing. Mm. And the immediate result of that thesis was that the uh, Wuhan Institute of Virology scientists went to the mine shaft and started sampling the bats and within a year they'd found a virus, uh, a SARS-like virus, which they published a bit, a little bit about uh, but in a very obscure way and then said no more about it. And then six years later the pandemic begins and the Wuhan Institute of Virology says, oh by the way, the closest relative, 96.2% the same, that we know of, is something that was found in Yunnan before. No reference to mm -hmm. their name. They changed the name of the virus. Uh, no link to their previous papers. It wasn't until the Seeker's theses came out that we were able to say, oh, hang on, you're talking about a virus you collected yes. six years ago. Um, in the wake of a human outbreak. And by the way, the human samples were also sent from the lungs of these miners, were also sent to Wuhan, not to anywhere else. Um, why didn't you tell us that? Yeah. And don't you think that's relevant? And what are the 
samples did you collect from that mine shaft? And then eventually a, another sleuth like the seeker um, called Francisco Ribera in Madrid said, hang on, I think I've found in a, another obs obscure data sets that you actually collected eight other viruses from that mine shaft. Did you? Well, a few months later, they admitted that they had. So it, it, these guys, these open source analysts, yes. they called themselves internet sleuths. Um, uh, there's, there's several others. There's uh, Rosana Segreto, Yuri Dagin, Mona Rahalka, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, Gilles de, de Meneuf. Uh, these are the people who've given, found out the most about Warm and Toll. Mm. They've done better than the mainstream journalists. Mm. They've done better than the mainstream scientists. They've done better than the intelligence agents. I mean, we've talked to a number of intelligence agents who've been helpful, but not nearly as helpful as these guys who are just amateurs yeah. who know how to search the internet yeah. and find information that's there. And that's, the, that's what makes this such an extraordinary story. If this was happening in... America or Europe, we wouldn't need to rely on people like yes. this. We'd, we'd go to the lab and ask the scientists, can you please show us your database? But we can't do that. It, it, it's, quite, it's quite fascinating how it, how it, it sort of unravels. Um, Alina Chan, your co-author, um, I read a piece recently, and I think it was in the Times, where she was saying that she was, you know, slightly in fear, um, you know, of, of her life. Is that something you feel too? I mean, is this sort of, you know, is this a dangerous book to write, even though you're saying what you're saying? Yes, it is. I mean, there is no question that Alina and I have, to some extent, increased the risk we're running by writing this book. It, it, it is very clear that the wolf warrior diplomacy that the Chinese state operates uh, is one of uh, that involves um, cyber attacks, denigration, um, uh, criticism of people who say unwelcome things about what's going on in China. And saying that uh, a laboratory leak might have been responsible for this outbreak is something that will not be welcome in China. Mm -hmm. So to, uh, to some extent, but we don't know to how much extent, we have to... Um, uh, be concerned about what the reaction will be. Yes. Uh, Alina is a working scientist. She's a postdoctoral uh, student at the um, uh, Broad Institute, which is a Harvard MIT research, the leading molecular biology institute in the world, basically. She's an extraordinary, brilliant young woman. She's Canadian. Um, and she uh, just got interested in this topic and said, I'm sorry. It's not good enough to say we don't know and when we may never know. Yeah. We need to find this out. Mm. And she's been absolutely relentless since. She became a very useful source for me as I got more intrigued in this subject. And eventually I proposed that we, we write a book together. Right. We were told by a lawyer, you won't be going to China again. Hope that's OK with both of you. Well, I'd like to go to China again. I think it's a wonderful country. I think they're wonderful people. I think they're under a non-wonderful regime mm. at the moment. Um, uh, but uh, we, you know, we, we don't want to exaggerate the degree to which we're in danger. We're not making a big scene about it. But yes, we, we can't deny that, 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 that one does run risks. <clears throat> Given that the mainstream media, for want of a better word, um, have, were very, very, should we say, uh, well, they certainly weren't curious about it to begin with. Um, how have they received this book, then, on the whole? Well, uh, it's quite interesting. Um, there's, there's still a lot of journalists and commentators out there who bought the idea that, it, that a laboratory leak was a conspiracy theory, mm -hmm. which was the, the phrase that was used again and again in the early part of the epidemic, who haven't moved on. Mm. They haven't re-examined the evidence. They haven't uh, looked at what has come to light since. Uh, and they haven't followed the whole story. And so some of them are reacting to our book by saying, well, this is ridiculous. These people are trying to inject life into a conspiracy theory. Mm. Um, surprisingly, 
to a surprising degree, that's the reaction uh, we've had from quite a lot of people. And I think there's a big disconnect here between mm. such sort of establishment commentators, if you like, mm. and uh, the general public and a lot of scientists. I mean, we are constantly being contacted by scientists who say, keep going. Thank God you're doing this. You're on the right track. But by the way, I don't say so because yes. I might not get a grant again. Yes. Well, how did it come to that? Yes. Um, one of the uh, in one of the reviews in in the Guardian, uh, talking about implausibility, uh, uh, they came up with something th 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 about the fact that the virus could have come about um, because of changed climate conditions and the loss of natural habitat for various creatures, uh, meaning therefore this would give rise to virus. I mean, that seems to me to be almost wanton you know, uh, extraordinary. Do you remember that? Uh, yes, and we don't discuss that issue in, in the book, um, but uh, I, I did look into this because I, I'm interested in this. There was a paper um, published by some very prominent virologist last year saying that deforestation is the cause of pandemics. There's no doubt about that. This is what's happening and this is bound to be one of the mm -hmm. parts of this story. Well, do you know what? southern China, where this virus came from, is the area in the world that is reforesting faster than anywhere on the planet, right. practically. I mean, it's certainly it's seeing an enormous increase in yeah. green vegetation going on at the moment. These, these rather in, uh, infertile, unfertile uh, hillsides uh, in remote areas where people were scratching out a living on, with terraced agriculture are clothed in new forest. Yeah. The, the forest cover has dramatically increased in that part of the world. So you cannot blame deforestation for this. Anyway, even if there had been deforestation, it, you know, it's just a sort of misunderstanding of ecology to think that you cut down a forest so the bats move to where they come into contact with people. Think about this for a minute. Mm. Back in the old days, people were not in cities, they were in villages. Mm, mm. They were out there catching animals for food. Mm. They were out there... Um, you know, digging guano out of bat caves to use as fertilizer in their fields. They were far more likely to come into contact with mm. bats in those conditions than they are now they live in cities. Mm. So uh, the ecological explanation for pandemics, which is very, very fashionable among a certain kind of environmental activist, simply don't make much sense. Yeah. Uh, and that's true, by the way, of, of other pandemics, you know, Ebola and so on. There's no evidence to link it to deforestation or changes in habitat or anything like that. Eventually, a scientist produced a paper this year saying, actually, reforestation might have caused this pandemic. Oh, really? There's more forests, <laughs> so there's more bats, because there's more insects, so people are more likely to come into contact mm -hmm. with a bat. Well. I mean, you know, honestly, you know, um, mm. uh, it, it, we, I'm a scientist. I believe you should produce evidence mm. for a theory, not speculation. Mm. Um, I have to ask you a little bit uh, on that front. You, you, you are very well known for your articles on the environment, and particularly environmentalism. Um, and uh, sort of coming at, as it seems that the pandemic is, or should we say, either becoming ingrained or towards its end, uh, suddenly now we are in the middle of this extraordinary, um, I would say, neurosis, actually, uh, about climate change. Um, you, what were your observations about what we've just had up in Scotland, uh, COP26? And do you think any evidence and hard fact came out of that? <laughs> um, well, uh, you, you say I'm well known for that, but I don't actually think that's particularly true. Uh, I have written four books about genomics in one form or another right. and none about climate change. Right. Um, I have written many, many articles about things like genetically modified crops, mm. um, uh, about innovation, you know, it's one of my passionate mm. topics, etc. But uh, the commentators say I'm best known for my comments on climate change. I don't think I am. I over the years, yeah. I have covered climate change for about 35 years since I was science editor of The Economist um, when it first blew up as an issue in the late 1980s. Uh, and I've moved from being quite alarmed by it to being much less alarmed. Mm. And I think we're 
hugely exaggerating, or at least the environmental activists are hugely exaggerating the problem and coming up with bad solutions. Um, so actually, in, and, and in the last couple of years, I've really not said anything about the topic, or at right. least very little. Um, uh, and I was out of the country when the Glasgow um, event Lucky you. took place um, uh, and was rather relieved. <laughs> I mean, it, just, it seems to me that, that the whole thing has has become unmoored from planet Earth in a way and is, is very distracted, very distinct from what the main uh, uh, requirements of ordinary people are. I, you know, the, the, the way to approach this issue is to think that human beings do need energy. If you don't mm. get available, reliable and affordable energy to people, they can't live um, uh, decent lives. And there's still a billion people without access to reliable energy. And a lot of them are depending on forests and going out and cutting down trees and coming into contact with wildlife as a result. So um, the more we can do to get people into a, a situation where they've got plenty of energy available, the better. Um, uh, to do that in a way that doesn't increase the carbon dioxide in the air is something that we should be uh, trying to do as well. Mm. And uh, But there's no way we can achieve that with renewable energy on a massive scale. It's too expensive, takes up too much land, involves too many resources, uh, is too unreliable. Uh, so it's got to be nuclear power if that's what you want to do. And I think that's, you know, that's just simple answer to, to this question. We, we should press ahead with nuclear wherever we can. Um, but we've also got to bring down the price of nuclear because we've driven it up with mm. a lot of, of, of things. So that's my view on that. But as I say, effectively for the last year and a half, I've been thinking about viruses, not climate change. Yes, 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 of course. I, I, you did actually come up with a, a great uh, name. Instead of Insulate Britain, I saw you Wrote insult Britain uh, recently. <laughs> they are, uh, you know, the, the people who are going around and gluing their faces to the yeah. to the to the ground yeah. and all of that. Well, it's it's it, it the the elitism of a lot of these environmental pressure groups mm. um, bothers me. Mm. Actually, it, this isn't a ground, grassroots, ground up um, organisation. This is the middle class trying to do a bit of virtue signalling and having a bit of fun at it. Mm. And I don't see why they should stop ordinary people getting to work. Uh, absolutely. Um, with that though in mind, I mean, you, you said you, you were first writing about this when you were at The Economist 30, 30 years ago. Um, do you think that there is some kind of religious type zeal? I mean, because throughout that time, Matt, you know, I, I, you know there have been so many sort of warnings, we have a hundred days left, or we have maybe a year left, or whatever it is, from Prince Charles all the way down. And, I mean, you, you know, you've written throughout that whole period. It, it does seem to be the case that there is a kind of, sort of like a strange sort of Armageddon type mentality, you know, sort of like deliver us from this. It's, it's a kind well, of religious. It's, it's not just with climate change. No. I mean, I, I was young in the 1970s, there were a lot of environmental concerns then. They related to the population explosion, mm. which was going to be unstoppable, the famine, which was going to be inevitable, mm. the pollution, which was going to shorten our lifespan, the, the rainforests were disappearing, the desert was expanding, the oil was running out. You know, there were all these scares about the, the environment. And they made me very pessimistic mm. as a young person mm. uh, about the future of the world. I don't remember grown up saying anything optimistic to mm. me at all mm. about the future in those days. So I was shocked when suddenly in the 1980s, I thought, well, hang on, the living standards are improving. Economic growth is happening. I thought that wasn't supposed to happen. Yes. I thought we were doomed. Mm. And then I noticed that these doom stories just kept being churned out by the media generation after generation. So I went back and looked at how long this had been going on. And I've traced it way back. I mean, right back to the mid early 19th century. I mean, you know, in the 1830s, you've got Macaulay saying, well, everyone, please shut up about how terrible this industrial revolution is, because actually it's probably raising people's living standards. Um, and, you know, he says, why is it that with nothing but improvement behind us, we're to expect nothing but deterioration before us? Every generation says 
Things have got better, but they're about to start getting worse. Mm. We are at the turning point. We, the narcissistic mm. us generation, mm. Mm. are the one who are about to go from things getting better to things getting worse. Mm. And I'm sorry, after 200 years of that, I take it with a pinch of salt. I think there's every reason to think that our, indeed the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says this, that our grandchildren will be richer than we are, particularly in developing countries, mm. Mm. if we allow innovation to flourish. Mm. Um, and yes, there will be problems relating to climate change and other things. I'm a passionate environmentalist. I, I'm a naturalist. Uh, I've been interested in environmentalism all my life. I worked on environmental... You won life. an award, didn't you, for... for yeah, I did, for, for uh, you know, on my own property in Northumberland mm. for uh, the environmental uh, mm. conservation. But I worked on environmental uh, conservation projects, wildlife conservation projects in the 1980s in India and Pakistan. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's in my blood. But when I look around the world and I look at what's threatening the wildlife that I love to watch as a bird watcher, it's much more invasive species than it is climate change. Mm. That's the problem. You know, you get invasive species and invasive diseases come in and damage um, uh, habitats mm. uh, and and ecosystems and uh, all you know wherever you go in the world whether it's the Galapagos or Hawaii or, or you know Iceland uh, I've been to lots of places and always the most urgent environmental issue is an invasive species one mm. it's true here you know the grey squirrel is getting rid of the red squirrel yes the signal crayfish is getting rid of the uh, native crayfish and so on um, so I just you know I'm not saying climate change doesn't matter I've always said it it's it is an issue but I think we've got it out of proportion with mm -hmm. other environmental issues. I mean, overfishing of the oceans is another one, and so on. You've, so, you've written about innovation in business, haven't you? And, uh, you know, and basically, so I take it from that you're saying, look, wait a minute, you know, we will actually innovate as time goes on. Yes. Um, my book, which only came out last year, is called How Innovation Works. And in, in that, I, I simply take lots of examples of innovation mm. from mm. vaccines to vaping you know uh, mm. to nuclear power to fertilizer to the aeroplane uh, and i tell their stories and i then try and see whether common themes emerge from those stories mm. uh, and if so how they tell us how we should set up the world to to encourage innovation right. because there is no doubt that innovation is the main source of the incredible improvements in human living standards that we've seen i mean in my lifetime the percentage of the world population that lives in extreme poverty a dollar 90 a day is the current agreed level is is that what it in, is now in today's right, yeah. in today's money yeah, yeah. or actually i think it's in 2009 money is right it, but anyway the, the, you know corrected for inflation the percentage of the world that lives at that level was over 50 percent when i was born it's now well less than 10 percent mm -hmm. now that's amazing mm -hmm. no one has ever lived through a diminution of poverty child mortality and other forms of misery as great as that mm -hmm. um no other human being has ever had that experience than we have in yeah. our generation and yet we're extremely pessimistic about the future um I think the only reason to be pessimistic is if we somehow prevent innovation happening. Um, the problem is, you see, we seem not to be just, uh, you know, uh, depressed about it. Or, uh, we're actually sort of going in on ourselves and disowning our past. I mean, you know, you had Greta Thunberg talking about the Industrial Revolution. Britain was particularly bad. You know, we've, we've got a particular price to pay. I think even the Prime Minister I think this past week has said something along the lines about the Industrial Revolution being, you know, uh, a bit of a problem. It's just like we're sort of going back now and sort of like yeah, atoning. The, well, the, there's, a, there's a terrible nostalgia mm. for a pre-industrial age. Mm. You watch a, you know, a Jane Austen adaptation and you think, oh, how lovely. They're all, you know, dancing under candles in a... Um, uh, you know, in a, in a country village, there's no smoke, there's no um, oil, there's no cars running up the streets, you know, doesn't it sound lovely? Hang on a minute, mm. examine the child mortality, mm. examine the, uh, the uh, lifespan of these people, examine the price of light. Mm. Do you know how long you had to work in 1800 on the average wage in the UK or the US? Mm 
to be able to earn one hour of light from a candle. No, well, Six hours. Really? Six hours of work for one hour of light. The average person could not afford a candle. So when you see those Jane Austen adaptations, remember, artificial light was a luxury of the yes, rich in those yes. days. Most things were a luxury of the rich. Yeah. You know, I, I, I have a passage in my book, The Rational Optimist, about this, you know, where I describe an idyllic scene in a, in a country village in 1800, and I say, well, hang on a minute, you know, um, you know the father's cough is going to kill him within a year, the children have lice-infested clothes, the mother has never been to a town, you know, they've none of them ever seen a play, you know, etc., etc. And I begin to sort of... Mm. Mm. dismantle this romantic myth so that we are we are haunted by this um, uh, uh, rose-tinted nostalgia for the past uh, you know I, I, somebody once said you know anyone who thinks life was better in the in the 18th century just mention one word to them dentistry <laughs> dentistry I can think of antibiotics actually and then, yeah, <laughs> that's that another thing. Yeah. Um, the book is now out the viral um, we have talked a bit about uh, uh, Alina Chan, but she, she's at, just, just to make clear again, she's not actually a journalist, is she? She's a... No, she's a, she's a working scientist. A working scientist. Um, she's she's a, 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 um, you know, a, a very successful professional scientist working on gene therapy and oh. uh, um, other molecular biology applications mm. uh, at the, as I say, the world's leading um, institute. She's got a fantastic career ahead of her doing that. She sometimes stops and says, how have I got diverted yes, <laughs> into yes, yes. doing this crazy thing? But she became such a reliable and careful observer mm. and contributor to the debate about the origins of COVID, um, largely on Twitter, which was the one social media forum that didn't censor any discussion of a laboratory mm. leak. Facebook censored it. Yes. If you said, I think this piece of evidence points towards a laboratory leak being the source of the virus, you weren't allowed. It was just yeah, wiped out. Yeah, yeah. Twitter allowed it. So these sleuths, these open mm. source analysts, um, and some scientists, including Alina, had a conversation saying, have you seen this bit of evidence? Have you seen that bit of evidence? Which gradually grew uh, to the point where the um, establishment could no longer ignore it. Mm. Um, so she's got a fantastic future as, as a scientist. Um, uh, it's been a remarkable experience for me. I've never co-written a book before. We didn't meet until after the book was finished. We met last week for the first time. Really? <laughs> um, uh, which was very moving, actually. Yes, of course, that's, yes, um, of course that's the way people of course, have... we'd spend a huge yeah. amount of time not yes. only communicating I in emails, but also face-to-face -face on, on, uh, uh, on screen. Um, uh, and uh, she wouldn't let me get away with... Uh, any mistakes or speculations or something, you know, some of my drafts, she'd say, well, hang on, I'm not sure we've quite established that, have yes. we? Yes. And I'd say, well, I think we have. And she would say, no, we haven't, you know, and she's often, she was always right, you know, good point. Yeah, no, the facts don't quite go that far. Uh, and we're not going to put speculation in the book. We're, we're going to, you know, stick, well, as far as possible, you know, we have to do some kind of uh, speculation, but not, not significantly. We're trying to stick to what we know and what it's telling us. Thing is, what, what, uh, writing a book like this, uh, the story is changing as you're writing it, presumably. Yes. I mean, you know, how long did this? It was about a year to write, was it, or more? Than yeah, that? we 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 uh, we pressed the button on doing it uh, less than a year ago. Mm. Um, I did the first draft in three months, which was something of a wow. record. She rewrote it in three months. Uh, we then rewrote each other's rewrites yes, for a couple yes. of months and right up till the middle of September we were taking we were taking news into it you know but you know there's a good example of a story that broke after the book was finished which is of relevance which was that some French and Laotian scientists working in Laos uh, found a virus that's even more closely related to that one from a mine shaft yeah um, uh, very, very slightly. It's 96.8% instead of 96.2% the same as SARS-CoV-2. And uh, you think, oh, okay, so maybe this virus came from Laos, not China, mm -hmm. right? And then, just a couple of weeks ago, some documents dropped from a Freedom of Information request by some of these other sleuths, 
which revealed that the EcoHealth Alliance, which is this American group that collaborates yeah. with the Wuhan Institute of Virology, were collecting viruses in Laos, among other countries, in uh, the period, um, well, the, over the last five or so years, and that instead of analysing those viruses in Laos or in America, they were sending them to their favourite partner in this work, the Wuhan Institute of Virology. So again, even with these viruses from mm -hmm. Laos, the only people we know who took samples from bats and took them to a place called Wuhan were the Wuhan Institute of Virology scientists. We don't have any evidence for wildlife trade between those two sites, but we do have evidence for scientists yes. taking bat samples from between these two sites. So, it, it, you know, even that story, which is, was immediately uh, greeted as being good news for the wildlife trade theory, doesn't really help that theory at all, because we now know this, this, this connection. We still don't know, of course, if they took this virus yes, <laughs> from Laos. Yes, yes. um, we do know that the virus that infects people has a particular genetic signature in it called a furin cleavage site that none of the other viruses, including this Laos one, has. And no other SARS-like virus has ever been found with this thing in it. And that's a bit mysterious as to how it got that. This is the thing that makes it particularly easy for humans, it's particularly infectious. Yeah, it makes it infectious and without it there would be no pandemic. We know that because we've done, experiments mm. have been done to take mm. it out and the virus becomes less infectious. Mm. So where did it get that from? Mm. Well, again, some information came to light very recently that uh, among the several labs around the world that, that did experiments putting furin cleavage sites into virus genomes deliberately to make them easier to grow in laboratories. Among those labs was the Wuhan Institute of Virology and the specific proposal of doing so with novel SARS-like coronaviruses was made in an application to the Pentagon by the EcoHealth Alliance in 2018 saying this is what we'd like to do if you give us the money. They didn't give them the money, so that's their excuse. Well, then they may not have done the experiment. But it would have been helpful yes. a year and a half yeah. ago to come forward with this information and say, exactly. by the way, we did actually ask to do this experiment, so maybe our partners in China did it anyway. So that's a relevant piece of information. And yet we had to find that out through a leak. Yeah. I'm sorry that the lack of transparency from establishment science here has really shocked me as someone who is a passionate supporter of science and mm. has been all his career. Is this the first book, do you know, to your knowledge, about the, the origins of the virus? Uh, no, Sherry Markson, who's an Australian uh, uh, journalist, produced a book a few weeks ago uh, called What Really Happened in Wuhan, mm. which is also a, a very good book. Um, not quite as good as ours, of course. No, of course. No. That's why she's not on the show. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm joking. I'm sure you know, it, it, it's a perfectly good book. Um, but it's, she goes into the politics of it slightly more than we do. Right. Um, and she speculates a little more than we do, I would say. But, uh, and, and there are other books out there. And people are saying, oh, come on, why are you writing a book? You know, I mean, this is too important for mm. a book. Well, we felt that there's no other form of words that's long enough to go into all the arguments for and against each hypothesis oh, God, no. than a book. Yeah. It's all very well yeah. writing blog posts and tweets and things like that. Mm -hmm. But at some point you've got to sit down and put all the evidence in one place, mm. stir it around, put it in order and see what, what you end up with. Yep. And I, you know, I partly wrote this book, uh, helped write this book with Alina because I wanted to satisfy myself. Yes as to what the evidence suggests. Mm -hmm. And for the future, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I very much hope that within a few months or a few years, we do know the answer for sure. Mm -hmm. And we can look back and say, well, we, you know, we didn't need that book because we've now found out. But I think even if that does happen, the story of how we found out and how we tried to find out is itself a very yes, interesting exactly. story. And the story mm -hmm. of these people, these mm -hmm. unsung heroes like mm -hmm. the Seeker and mm -hmm. Francisco Ribera and Charles Small here in the UK and people like that mm -hmm. is is a, 
is a is an important story that needs telling. It's it's a slightly it's a, almost a democratic thing. You know, yes, yes. Actually, ordinary people mm. can can contribute to this story. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Viral: The Search for the Origin of COVID nineteen by Alina Chan and Matt Ridley. This is again, it's just out. Um, I think extremely important book. Matt, thank you very much for coming in and, and explaining uh, about it. It's an extraordinary story as well. Thank you very, very much. No, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And um, thank you. Uh, that's it for So What You're Saying Is uh, this week. Uh, we shall see you next time. Thank you.